when I was asked to make a video about uh, the Reformation, um, I immediately began to think back to my early days uh, as a seminary student uh, because it was during those days uh, that I read uh, words that Martin Luther wrote for the first time. Uh, because it really did change my life as I uh, began to study Reformation theology and the lives of the great Reformers, uh, and has shaped um, uh, my calling as a minister of the Gospel. Uh, certainly, whoever is called to preach the Gospel wants to preach it faithfully, and surely uh, the great Reformers have helped us to do that. Uh, I realize I can't say everything that could be said because the, the Reformation is a great ocean of theology and church history and help for, for believers. Uh, and I decided to center on, on something that um, has, uh, has sometimes, uh, I won't say it's neglected, but it's a lesser known um, aspect of the watershed that was the Reformation. And that was Luther's uh, doctrine of alien righteousness. And I'll get back to that. But before we you know, talk about alien righteousness directly, we need to think a little bit about uh, really what, uh, what compelled the Reformation in the life of Martin Luther that then reverberates through the whole Reformation. And I think I'll start by noting that Martin Luther had a very high view of righteousness. His understanding of righteousness uh, when he was a monk uh, was not watered down. Uh, and he, his goal as a monk was to make use of every tool, every help, uh, every avenue for sinners to pursue righteousness, to take hold of those, take full advantage of them so that he could uh, provide to God what God requires. And what he requires is righteousness. And it's a righteousness uh, that uh, includes with it uh, utter holiness and perfection, no blemish. Uh, when we come before the holy God, uh, and He examines us, He needs to find uh, nothing to displease Him at all. And so that was the quest that Luther set for himself. The Reformation of the 16th century is not uh, understandable uh, apart from Luther's inability to gain a good conscience before God. Uh, and so uh, for those of us who perhaps are able to gain a good conscience before God, uh, easier than some other people, we couldn't have, we couldn't have been Luther. Uh, it took a person who couldn't gain uh, a good conscience before God. Uh, one of the major uh, helps that the church provided for sinners uh, seeking holiness was uh, confession. And uh, Martin Luther was blessed with a wonderful uh, confessor, Johann von Staupitz, uh, who was also uh, a fine theologian in his own right. And when Luther uh, made his way to the confessional, he did his very best to confess all of his sins. Because if, we're, if, we, are, if we confess our sins, then the Bible says that our Lord is just and righteous and will forgive our sins. And so Luther tried to confess all of his sins. But he also read in Holy Scripture that there are hidden sins. And how can I be forgiven from hidden sins if I don't know what they are? He also would experience pangs of conscience sometimes right after he left the confessional. He would leave the confessional thinking, I've confessed all the sins that I know about. And not long after, he would think of other sins in his life that he'd forgotten, and he'd rush back in and try to, to, to confess those. And Luther realized that at any given time, there are sins in his life that he's just not aware of. You know, sin blinds us to ourselves. And so he, if he doesn't know what they are, he can't confess them. If he doesn't know what they are, he, he cannot repent of them. And so how can he gain... Uh, the forgiveness of sins that is offered to us in the gospel. Well, at, at some point in this long, torturous saga 
of Luther's search for uh, righteousness, which would be the only basis by which he could find favor with God, uh, his superior, Johann von Staupitz, uh, gave him an assignment. He said, I want you to become a professor of biblical studies. And he did, and especially a professor of the Old Testament. And he began to slave away at, at exegesis and the languages and hermeneutics. And uh, he, he was a relentless pursuer of the meaning of the Word of God. And as he did that, he began to encounter passages that really didn't fit with how he tended to think about uh, the requirement of righteousness that he faced and all of us sinners face before God. He read uh, in Romans uh, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, how could that be? How could it be that a person uh, who is still a sinner, which Romans 7 seemed to indicate was the case, how could a person now have no condemnation? Uh, how could God examine a person and there be no sin to condemn? Luther was sure that he, he was not capable of undergoing such a divine examination and, and coming out uh, clean. He also was struck by uh, many of the Psalms, but in particular, Psalm 22. That was the Psalm that Jesus had quoted on the cross. Uh, Jesus' cry of dereliction, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, which really uh, was a claiming of the whole Psalm by Jesus. A Psalm that also includes, you know, I'm a worm and no man. And here Luther, uh, Luther's prior views about Christ uh, were challenged to the core. Uh, Luther's view of Christ uh, is depicted uh, in late uh, medieval uh, Christianity uh, on gravestones that Luther and others would see uh, just as a matter of course. It was Christ sitting above the circle of the earth uh, with the scales of justice in one hand and uh, with his other hand dispatching, uh, uh, separating sheep from goats and dispatching uh, the goats to uh, eternal damnation. It was the Christ who comes as judge as he is depicted uh, in the Sistine Chapel by, by Michelangelo. And in fact, Michelangelo was working on those paintings in the Sistine uh, Chapel uh, when Luther was 25 till he was 29 years of age. Christ for Luther was a judge. And uh, the threat of God's wrath uh, was very real uh, to Luther. At one point, Staupitz told Luther, you know, uh, stop racking your brains constantly with all of these, these nitpicky uh, dolly sins uh, and um, just love Christ. And Luther responded, I love him, I hate him. He hated him because his picture was, was of Christ was only as Christ the judge. But now he was struck by uh, and had to face that there was a different way of looking at Christ right there in God's holy word. Christ, uh, he, are, he chose words from the Psalms that sounded like Luther's own agonizing cries to God Himself. Jesus, Jesus speaks like me. Jesus feels like I do. My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? And one passage really um, looms large uh, in Luther's theology. It's in Philippians chapter 3, uh, verses 8 and 9. And there the Apostle Paul uh, says that he counts everything as rubbish or dung in order to gain Christ. And the everything he's talking about there is it's not just any everything. It's especially everything that uh, his fellow Jews uh, 
uh, Pharisees were counting on as they faced the judgment of God. They were counting on their uh, adhering to the law uh, according to the letter and being perfect in their adherence to the law. And the Apostle Paul says he did all of that. He was circumcised the eighth day. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Which is very much like what Luther would eventually say, that if any person ever gained their salvation by their monkery, it was I. Paul said, I long to be found in Him, in Christ. It's a very important a uh, phrase in the New Testament and very important to Luther and for the Reformation in Christ. Remember this passage in Romans that had stopped him in his tracks. Uh, in Romans 8, where it says, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And here the same Paul is saying, I long to be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own. Not having a righteousness of my own. This is the alien righteousness of Luther's Reformation theology. It, it, was, it shattered his whole understanding of, of what it means to uh, find God's favor, what righteousness means. This was a righteousness that Paul pursued that would not be his own. Wouldn't be his own then. Wouldn't be his own ever. What would he mean? What was he saying? The righteousness by which we're saved is not a righteousness of our own. It's not a righteousness which if God examines us, He finds us to possess our own righteousness. And by that righteousness, we gain forgiveness. Well, we wouldn't even need forgiveness, would we? We were already righteous. Forgiveness for past sins. But no, none of that worked. Paul has given up seeking a righteousness of his own. He's not interested in a righteousness of his own. Uh, there can be no righteousness of his own. I want to read a passage from uh, this biography. It's of Roland Baton, Here I Stand. And it's an excerpt from a sermon that Martin Luther preached. And it has a couple of words in it that are crucial for understanding uh, not only his understanding of the gospel, uh, but also uh, it teaches us something about how the Christian life is lived in light of the gospel that Martin Luther discovered. This is what he, he said in his sermon. This is wonderful news to believe that salvation lies outside ourselves. I am justified and acceptable to God, although there are in me sin, unrighteousness, and horror of death. And this is a word I want us to really focus on. Yet I must look, I must look elsewhere and see no sin. This is wonderful not to see what I see, not to feel what I feel. Before my eyes I see sin and unrighteousness and horror of death. But when I look to Him, I see forgiveness and hope. Um, Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk. He belonged to the Augustinian order. And he loved the writings of St. Augustine. And Augustine had used uh, th this term incurvatus in a certain way, which means to be curved in. But Martin Luther really developed uh, that understanding of Augustine in a very special way. And Martin Luther describes one, uh, one of the consequences of our sin is that we look for salvation and look for the righteousness that we must have in order to be saved uh, in a particular place. We look for righteousness in ourselves. And when we do that, it curves us in on ourselves. 
Luther's efforts in the monastery were efforts by which he sought with his own will and with his own mind and with his own strength and all that he had to make himself righteous because that is what God deserves and that is what God requires and otherwise I'm lost. But now he's learned that the good news of Jesus Christ is that the salvation offered to us in Him doesn't depend on anything we bring to the table. It doesn't depend on any righteousness that we can bring, any, any holy efforts that we can bring, any, any amount of prayers or how eloquent those prayers are. The salvation that, we get in G, that, that is offered to us in Jesus Christ comes to us from outside of ourselves. And so what the Gospel says to us is not hunker down, try hard, pray hard, do better, make incremental progress. All of that is bankrupt. None of that can avail anything. In fact, it's based on a lie that God made us to be people who, were, who are uh, given gifts and strengths and resources, and then He sets us down in this world and says, now you do your best with those resources, and then we'll judge you in the end, and we'll rank you, and we'll see if you've done well enough uh, to uh, gain eternal life. That's always been a lie. And Luther came to understand that. Even Adam and Eve, weren't re they were required to do the same thing he was being required to do. Not to look to himself, but to look to the One who made him to trust that one's Word and to believe when He's told by that one, your sins are forgiven and you're My child. And so you uncurl yourself from the being curved in on yourself and you look to Jesus Christ who is righteous. And we're told by Him that if we believe in Him, that His righteousness becomes our righteousness. This Luther called the marvelous exchange. That Jesus becomes the sinner and takes that place, the place that I've earned, the place that belongs to me. And then I take His place. I'm now righteous. When God looks at me, He sees His perfect, holy, righteous Son. His merit. My merits don't matter anymore. I look to Him. Well, that is salvation by grace. And it is a righteousness by which we live, listen, that never becomes ours. It's always bestowed. It's always alien. That kind of gospel understandably cause people to say, well, if you preach that, if you preach that salvation comes by looking away from your stinking sinful self with your sinful ambitions and desires and transgressions and hate and jealousy and rebellion, is to look away from that like it doesn't even exist and look to one who is righteous and trust Him to forgive you because you've given up on trusting in yourself. You know what that's going to lead to. That's going to lead to lawlessness. That's going to undercut incentives for right living. If you preach that, then no one will live right, which has a perfect logic to it, doesn't it? it why would I try to live right if living right can't, can't help me at all for being saved? If, if, right, if the righteousness by which I'm saved is utterly bestowed, it's declared, why in the world would I try to live right? Well, this all had to be worked out for Luther too because he had works in the wrong place. Luther thought works really mattered. But they matter differently than he had thought. Let's read another passage. This is from uh, Luther's uh, canticle on freedom of the Christian man. And all students who come to Beeson read this. I'm so pleased to know that it doesn't happen in a class that I teach normally, but I'm so pleased to know that every student who comes through Beeson will read this before they graduate. This is what Luther writes. 
The soul which with a firm faith clings to the promises of God is united with them, absorbed by them, penetrated, saturated, inebriated by their power. If the touch of Christ was healing, how much more does that most tender touch in the Spirit, that that absorption in the Word, convey to the soul all the qualities of the Word so that it becomes trustworthy, peaceable, free, full of every good, a true child of God. And he goes on to say, Good works do not make a man good, but a good man does good works. Works are of great value, but they have no power to save us. What's happened to good works now? Good works are now, we're taught, never have anything to do with making us the children of God, gaining salvation, or keeping us the children of God. And to believe that it's so is a lie, and it is a dishonoring of Jesus Christ who died on the cross to save us, and saves us by grace through faith. And so He's not pleased when we imagine that any work we could ever do could make us right with God or keep us right with God. Works flow from our from what God does inside of us when we believe in Him. I encourage you in this season of the uh, celebration of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation to pursue... Uh, the writings of Martin Luther and John Calvin and Huldreich Zwingli and others, and discover that uh, these men, these great uh, writers of the Reformation, they're teaching us things that we can count on, not because they're attractive to us just on the surface, but because they illumine passages of Scripture. Don't forget that What brought the Reformation about was a combination of Luther's bad conscience, his pursuit of righteousness, and then his confrontation with passages of Scripture that compelled him to recognize that the only hope for salvation and the actual offer of salvation is not one in which we make ourselves righteous, but one in which righteousness is given to us as a gift. 